It's a couple more seconds. And then what we'll do is um, we can actually hand over and, and do a few introductions. Um, just to let you know who we've got um, on, the, on the panel today. So we've got Jamie, Bob, and obviously Rob, as always. Uh, I know it's last webinar was a bit confusing where it was Jason and Mason, and now we've got Rob and Bob. Um, so we'll see what, who we can invite next week, just to make it even more confusing for everyone. Um, but yeah, what I'm, I'll do now is I'll just hand over for a few intros. Um, Bob, if you're right to just introduce yourself, just a very quick 10 seconds introduction, and then Jamie, and then if followed by Rob, and then Rob, if you want to take it away from there, that'd be great. Hi, right, thanks, mate. Yeah, I'm Bob Wright. I work for um, a company called Adcock Refrigeration and uh, Air Conditioning, predominantly an M&E based construction company. Um, I'm the group safety manager. Uh, for the company. I've got um, a lot of experience in that sort of region uh, and I, I sort of represent a few other organisations as well in terms of safety and uh, technical excellence. So that, that's a little bit about me. Hi everyone, I'm Jamie and I'm founder and CEO of Hands HQ uh, and I've been, so yeah, I've been here since the very beginning, eight years ago. And good afternoon everyone. Rob Bullen, health and safety guru, I get told at Hands HQ been part of the company now for, for a year, but I've been spending my time as a health and safety professional over the last 10 years and never, never looked back. So the topic we're discussing today is looking at cloud-based SaaS. So I guess, first of all, what on earth SaaS actually is? What are the benefits that will be presented to your good selves if you're embracing a SaaS product? what the procurement process may look like if you're thinking about embracing a SaaS product, and of course the next steps moving forwards. And as Mason's already kindly said, please do make sure any questions that you have, we always do a halfway break where we can talk about any questions or concerns that you have, and I will do my best to, to respond to those. And of course the rest of the panel here will be able to chip in as well. We all have different sort of expertise and different perspectives. So if I may jump in, what on earth is SaaS? Um, it stands for software as a service. And the best way I could do, kind of describe the, um, the definition is it's very much focused on offering a digital solution. So customers have a problem. The reason this business started in the first place was to plug that gap, to try and resolve that solution as best as possible. So what I really like about SaaS is it's not just um, a product or software. The actual business model of that company looks to enhance the experience further. So to put this into perspective, um, I'm quite simple minded. I couldn't think of any other examples, but 25 years ago, the highlight of my life was my parents driving me to the local blockbusters to solve my boredom. Of course, I ran around the store, selected a product, paid the fee, and then I could enjoy it at home. But of course, there are problems around that model. If I forgot to return the video on time, I had late payment fees. To get the product in the first place, I had to go to the store. And sometimes with brand new releases, might not even be available. There was certain supply and demand around in the shop. And I've actually been a big supporter of the solution for, so for SaaS uh, in this example, is Netflix or any video on demand service, which I'm sure we can all agree has been a bit of a lifesaver during these lockdowns. Now, what I like about Netflix is it describes the SaaS model nicely because it enhanced that entertainment experience. Now, we all know now that something like Netflix or similar products, I don't even have to leave my home to enjoy the movie. And it entertains everyone's supply. I don't have to wait for another VHS copy to be returned to then enjoy that video. And as long as I've got an internet connection and a screen, actually, I can do it anywhere. I just pay that one subscription fee. and I have access to everything. The fact it's in the cloud as well. I mean, just behind me, I used to be a DVD collector. I've got oodles of DVDs there. The use of Netflix, I never even had to find space for then enjoying those videos. And the real part I liked about Netflix was the fact that they then developed algorithms to give me recommendations. You know, based on my viewings, you'll probably like this. So if I was stuck for choice, I was actually guided in that experience. So it might be a bit silly, but you can see that's what SaaS is trying to aim. It's not just here's a software product. It's trying to enhance the whole experience for that problem that you may have. Um, Jamie, if you wouldn't mind me asking, you know, probably there might be a, a better example in the tech industry that you might be able to share. Yeah, well, I think um, Microsoft's Office is actually a good example of the, the transition from traditional software to SaaS. 
So some of us will remember um, Microsoft Office 95 it would arrive in a big box containing a couple of CD-ROMs and it cost about 800 quid. And um, what would happen is every year, Microsoft would release a new version, say Office 97. Um, but you might decide you don't need all those new features so you can avoid paying the 500 pound upgrade cost. But then, um, you know, eventually you start getting given files on a floppy disk that you can't open anymore because your version of Office doesn't support the latest format. Um, so you end up paying another 800 quid for Office 2000. And today, Office is called Microsoft 365. And so you access it through your browser um, and you pay about 80 pounds a year for it. So now it's a service, you never really own it. And if you stop paying, you lose access to it. But what you do get is, is the latest version of the software um, for essentially a lower total cost. Brilliant, thank you for that, Jamie. That's probably much more, uh, much more relevant example than certainly my one anyway. So it's all well and good as talking about how you define a SaaS, you know, what are the actual benefits of developing SaaS products and specifically safety SaaS? Because I guess that, that's the background I've come from. I only ever know health and safety. And I think the, probably the first point I could think of, and it was very much, you know, still topical, a SaaS product allows you to be what I would argue COVID secure. If you've got a good relationship with your workforce and a good understanding of the safe systems of work required, you can actually then start to write these remotely. And then because you're not having to be on site, you know, that transmission risk of COVID is thus reduced. So I think that's quite a nice topical example there. What I think a lot of our customers and people looking at SaaS models like the productivity element of a SaaS product. So looking at that automation and better experience to manage that workflow. And, and Bob, if you don't mind me asking, you know, I, I guess I know you're a supporter of SaaS products. That's why you're good selves on the panel here. If I may ask, you know, what drivers and advantages did you see when you were considering SaaS products for your business? Yeah, thank, thanks, Rob. Yeah, there's, you know, as, as a company and, and having worked for several companies previously, we looked at several aspects and did a lot of uh, research around this, you know, and we were looking for a system that was sort of intuitive and easy for, for the end user, you know, and making sure that they could actually access and use this easily. Um, as a, as a result of this particular SaaS system, we've had a better um, engagement with our, our workforce uh, and increased uptake as well compared to some other systems that we've used. Um, it, it sort of reduced our admin burdens as well, you know, across our business and, and, and compared to some other SaaS platforms and some other older systems, as you mentioned earlier with the Netflix and, and Blockbuster sort of comparisons, it's, a, it's been, a, been a life sort of saver in that particular aspect. And we, we've we sort of looked at the fact that it was cloud-based because we need to access this in the field as well. So our, our site guys and girls need to get hold of this in the field and use this on a day-to-day -day basis. And that works for all our supply chain partners as well. So up and down the chain, whether it be a supplier or a contractor and or a client. So, so it works, works sort of omnidirectionally, if you like. So it's a really good fit. Uh, um, we also look at the aspects, you know, in terms of um, the user experience for our contractors and our clients as well. And that was something that was really important. And it just seemed to fit that that sort of glove very well, you know, in line with the, the first comment I made, you know, with regards to um, intuitive and simple to use, essentially. Um, a, a lot of the clients and contractors that we've engaged, you know, we, we've sort of shown them different systems that we want to use in terms of SaaS and how it can improve administratively or otherwise. And, and they've been very impressed with this particular system um, and, and the stakeholders love it as well. Um, just the little things really, you know, update of revision numbers, which gives us currency and therefore makes it makes us sort of relevant, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the fact that you've got electronic sign-off because as a business, we're trying to drive away from hard copies, but you know, there are still requirements for that. Some of our clients still need that and therefore that, that, that function sits there, but we are sort of driving it hard on the electronic sign-off side of things, which is fantastic. And that, that, that again, operates on me directionally across the board. Um, we, we get these produced as a business. We, we sort of, we really focus this on our management streams and our supervisor streams who produce this sort of, these sort of um, risk management processes within our business with, with the support of myself and the team. Uh, and because of its intuitiveness again, and the fact that it's easy to maintain and amend and obviously update automatically, it, it was very much favored by the, the actual users themselves in that particular aspect. So. So, as you can see, quite a few things stand out. I mean, biggie for us really was also that it satisfies the requirements around um, 
ISO, so 9,001, 14,001, 45,001, 27,001 in particular with the data protection side of things. Uh, and it also satisfied our other external auditors from SSIP, the Common Assessment Standard, Construction Line Gold, um, Chas Premium, Refcom Elite, who's a, an industry-based organization and so on. So it met all the sort of um, requirements based or born of these um, UCAS certified organizations. So yeah, but, you, you know, Put, put, put simply, the, the, the simpleness and, and the ease of access was fantastic for us. Brilliant. No, oh, thank you for sharing, Bob. It's great to hear the advantages actually in the field, you know, some practical examples there. And, and I think what I really wanted to pick up on, if I may, there, there were two key points there, which you know, we were talked about before, is around, although there are some advantages to SaaS, there is still a couple of reservations. And, and very much when we're adopting uh, cloud products, we're thinking that, well, we instantly think about worried about the likes of data protection, cybersecurity. Uh, and I know offline, Jamie and I've had discussion around this as well. And Jamie, if I may sort of pose the question just to get a different angle outside of a health and safety professional's opinion, you know, what, what does ISO standards sort of add value for you? Why, why are you so passionate about having that? Because as we know, Hands HQ do have 27,001 certification. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, businesses are, are shifting um, you know, the more and more they're shifting their IT operations off premises and into the cloud. And that means they're trusting third parties with their employees and, and their customer sensitive data. Um, so, you know, ISO 27001 information security management is a framework for securing that data, um, but also shows a business's commitment to preventing it from falling into the wrong hands. Um, GDPR is obviously a big subject. We could have a whole series of webinars just around that subject. Hopefully, we don't know. Um, but in essence, um, you know, it's there to ensure there's there's consequences for um, you know people that are irresponsible or are, or are misusing that personal data. Oh, thank you for that. And, and I think the second point I, I did mention there was one other I wanted to raise. If, if I can ask another question to you, good sir. Mm is with your background you know I, I forgot to explain that you know because you've started up the company and very much come from a user experience background or what we call on the slide here ux for short it, it's probably a discipline that well certainly i myself don't understand and i think a lot of health and safety professionals don't get that much exposure to ux and and i think it's important because as bob mentioned there you know SaaS products you know no matter what solution that they're trying to solve they have to be user friendly to have that uptake in being utilized in a business Business. Hmm. So maybe if you wouldn't mind giving us like a couple of minutes summary about what the user experience is and how that enhances a user friendly system. Yeah, well, I'll start off by, you know, explaining how things have been up until, you know, the past few years. Um, I think most people um, have, are used to using clunky and out of date software at work, at least. There's, um, you know, one or two platforms that no one really enjoys using. And I think, um, you know, the reason why that is, is because the attitude of, of B2B software providers is, is it's always been that they don't need to invest in making the software easy to use because they know that it's their, their user's job to use it. But the more forward thinking software businesses understand that, you know, in order to drive adoption and, and, and remain competitive, that you, you've got to have design at your core. Um, and when I talk about design I'm not just talking about you know colors and you know the the positioning of things and the size of buttons the bits that the user sees that's really just the the, the tip of the iceberg um yeah exactly and uh uh you know the, the user experience which is um you know often called UX is everything that happens below the surface it's just the stuff that the user doesn't necessarily see but all the planning the research mapping user journeys creating prototypes testing um, to make sure that you create the best solution possible and there's no reason why business software shouldn't be as easy to use as you know instagram or spotify or something like, like that and i think um, as the you know the technology space matures the decision makers are realizing that that you know they can be more picky and that design is is um, you know really important Brilliant. Thank you, Jamie. It's, it's certainly been an enlightening experience for me over the 12 months, because as I said, we, I've had no exposure to this. And I, I'm sure Bob agrees that, you know, we, we want to make sure the pro any product we find is suitable for our audience and to realise that the work that goes under it, it, it's not actually always a simple solution. You've got to think about, OK, what makes the experience the best for people using that product? So it's used in the first place and you get that good return of investment. So if I may, I wanted to move on to the next part around the actual procurement process. You know, a, a lot of us in, in our health and safety roles, and for that matter outside, do get involved in procurement processes, you know, bringing suppliers on board. 
And uh, you, you're good selves on the audience here. If you wouldn't mind, you can see there's a question at the bottom here. I'm always keen to learn and share knowledge about what your pre-qualifying questionnaire process is to bring suppliers on board. Do you have any barriers or struggles with it? Is it quite a faultless process? Um, is there any good practices you can share with everyone on this call? Um, but certainly if I can sort of make a starter for 10 whilst we're waiting for any questions coming in, I think the procurement process needs to be simple when it comes to SaaS products. Of course, we need to do our due diligence, but we need to make sure that the process that we followed, everyone can buy into it and it's solving all of the barriers that you're going to be presented with. So as a quick, quick recap, and apologies if I am teaching you all to suck eggs, but you know, you can't start a procurement process with actually defining what the problem is. You know, what solution are you looking for? And how best are you going to tackle that? So I often get asked, Rob, yeah, it's all well and good. I've got a lot of problems in the business. You know, where do I find the improvements to explore SaaS products if I want to look at you know, digitizing and, and modernizing our process? Well, again, I can only speak as a health and safety professional, but improvements should be in your trend analysis. I always encourage people when speaking with them, okay, have you noticed any trends in your accident stats over the last five years? Or what have your recent inspection internal audits and external audits been? Are there any trends where you think we've got a big problem maybe around PPE, for example, or safe systems of work or, or whatever that subject is? And then the second step is looking at, okay, you found that problem, you want to improve it, obviously, but you need to define the needs. What do you actually need that solution to look like? What does it need to offer? And that's where the deal breaker part comes in. You've got to define, to solve this process, what are the absolute musts? And then what are the nice to have? because I don't think there's one single product out there that is a silver bullet. We need to make sure that there's limitations of every supplier and you need to then define what you truly need to get out of it to solve your problem. It's kind of like that gap analysis I think we talked about in a couple of webinars last year for, for those that attended. Then after I think those two questions have been asked, it's very much then around, I think, three practicalities. It's understanding what's your budget to then actually resolve this uh, problem. Are there any deadlines or timelines that you need to work towards? And of course, most importantly, who are the decision makers and what's that process within procurement? Who do you need to win an influence over to get that idea, initiative or SaaS product you're looking to implement? And I, I guess it's probably useful now to kind of look at a case study or a practical example. And, um, and Bob, you know, if you wouldn't mind me picking on you again, I'm sort of keen to understand at your good selves at Adcock, what's your current procurement process for bringing on any supplier, just so we can learn from that? Oh, yeah, Rob. Um, so, I mean, a lot of you guys and girls will be familiar with this sort of process, but ours is very much born on our ISO certification. Uh, and, and it's an integrated management system that we use um, with all the requirements born of that. So we essentially have built into that a three-tier sort of um, supply chain partner approval process, you know, depending on whether you're a supplier or a contractor or, or do a bit of both and so on and so forth. So, um, and obviously we look at the client aspect as well. Um, what we need to do is prove our intent really and demonstrate from a risk management perspective, um, how we could do this using a, a SaaS product that, you know, as, as is we're discussing today. Um, the overriding sort of drivers for us really were, were the time saving elements and therefore obviously there was a cost saving element in that. Um, we actually looked at it and we studied it against quite a few different products and um, we had a 50% saving on our particular um, applicational needs within this sort of SaaS uh, uh, product. Um, ease of use again, I know we mentioned it earlier on, but it was really important that um, the end product was, was easy to use. Uh, suitable and sustainable in terms of its look and, and its application, making sure that people sort of had that buy-in again. And, and we did get a large amount of engagement from our clients, our stakeholders, our contractors, uh, and so on and so forth. So, so it, it eased up on that particular system. And, and look at the understanding, you know, what it is you're trying to achieve. Um, it's, it's important that um, to know that I didn't really have to adjust or amend anything, really. And maybe a few little tweaks with regards to our PQQ process involving this particular SAS. In fact, it probably made it a bit easier, you know, in terms of how we applied that against our um, verification processes within the business. I hope I'm not sort of waffled too much there, and that's giving you a bit of a feel for how it sort of, sort of really digs into our organisational stand-up, really. 
Sure. Well, thank you for sharing that, Bob. And certainly the, the conversations that we've had, you know, offline before this, we, we very much mentioned our passion about, you know, following set processes. And of course, PQQ, a lot of us as safety professionals think about the, the past 91 standard, you know, bring in, in construction anyway, to look at addressing the right questions and making sure we can demonstrate our due diligence. Um, but as you said, the fact that you didn't need to amend or, um, or completely change the process for bringing on a SaaS product is great to hear, because I think although we all agree one size can't always fit all, we need to make some processes as linear and universal as possible just for our sanity that we can follow it okay and we know a set process that the whole business can follow. So no, I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you very much. Great, couple of questions we've got here. Um, yeah, Jamie, sure. I wanna throw this one out to you if that's all right. We had a great question come through from Jason. So uh, thanks Jason, I, I don't expect any less. Good question as always. Um, the question is Jamie, how um, referencing Rob, your analogy of blockbusters at the very beginning, and I guess the downfall of old processes uh, moving over to SaaS. So how can you, us, how can HazardQ prevent HazardQ from becoming the next blos blockbuster, i.e. evolution? Jamie, I don't know if you can fill us in uh, with that at all around sort of product development, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that's a great question and one that's, you know, always front of mind for us. We want to make sure that, um, you know, we're continuously innovating. We don't want to just be, um, you know, adding on things that make us incrementally better we want to be doing that obviously but we also want to be make, creating innovative differentiators so things that are going to take us two three four steps ahead of whatever anyone else is doing in the market um and in order to do that we we you know we're growing the team um we've set some really ambitious goals for this year um and uh yeah hopefully i mean we, actually next month i think we've got um a uh, um a big big launch of lots of new features that we've been working on so Hopefully we'll be able to announce those very soon. Thank you, thanks for that. Uh, we do have, uh, hopefully that's answered your question there, Jason. Uh, we do have another question as well, um, which is just around the procurement um, of software. Um, it's from another Bob, um, Bob from, from Middlesbrough. Thanks for joining again this week. Um, but the question was, and, and Jamie, this might be, um, a potentially good question for you or, or, or Rob with your experience of procuring software. So aside from, a generic Google search, where can I find SaaS solutions or SaaS softwares? Who wants to start? <laughs> I, can, I mean, I, I, can, I can give it a go. I mean, um, I probably wouldn't start with a Google search, to be honest. Um, I would go to whatever community. So, you know, um, when, we're, when we're building product, um, there's a Slack community that I'm part of, which is, you know, people that are product managers or product designers. And I'll go in there and, and ask an opinion because, you know, the thing with, uh, you know, Google search is that people are paying to appear there. And just because you're paying the most to appear at the top doesn't necessarily mean that your product is the best. So I go to the community and ask them. And I know that, um, you know, in the health and safety community, a lot of, there's a lot of knowledge sharing going on there. So I think that would probably be a good place to start. Obviously, that doesn't help if you don't have a lot of traction to begin with. Um, but, you know, that, that word of mouth builds up over time. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Jamie. So certainly for me, Mason, if I can put my two pennies worth in, um, I, I always religiously read the IOSH magazine every month. And probably about, I'd say, at least a third of that magazine is purely around... Um, adverts about SaaS products and training. So to keep my sort of knowledge abreast, I'm always checking through adverts to see what's actually available on the market, you know, doing a bit of sort of commercial, commercial exposure really to understand what's still going on. And I'm very trusting of my community as well. I'm quite an active, active member on LinkedIn. So I do actually pose a lot of questions on LinkedIn or speak to groups that Jamie mentioned, like his Slack community, that there's lots of LinkedIn groups that I, sign up to on health and safety and just speak to all of my contacts I've developed through my 10 years experience because yeah there's not one single person that knows absolutely everything but I try and develop as many people in my network as possible to know oh okay yeah if I need to know about Kosh for example I know to go to Jimmy and Jimmy would give me information oh these Kosh products are available this is what you might want to look at so my solutions always driven around speaking with my peers and just keeping my eyes peeled on the market 
So I, I hope that answers your question as well, Bob. Yeah, definitely reach out to the wider community, see what's available, what people can recommend, and then to follow your nose from there to do your own due diligence. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate that. We do have a few more questions, but um, we can come on to those um, towards the end and our next sort of Q&A break, because I know we've got a few more slides um, to, to, to cover. Yeah. So any more questions, feel free to throw them in and we can um, run through them at the end as well. Brilliant. Thanks, Mason. I think you'll be pleased to know before final questions, and this is the final slide for me anyway, and it's, it's looking at next steps. So I kind of challenged myself when writing this thinking, okay, yeah, it's all well and good. We can support SaaS and there's a lot of people here that enjoy using SaaS products, but how do we choose the right solution? What's the next practical step I need to do? And I'm very passionate about this. I, I don't know if, if people are aware of this analysis already. So once again, apologies if I am teaching you to suck eggs, but I use the Vireo analysis that refers to four factors that you initially review on a supplier to see if they're a right fit for your business and you can then develop a long-term partnership. And this stands for looking at the value that you're getting from the supplier, how rare they are, whether the product can be imitated. So I'm looking at scaling there so it fits as much as my business as possible so I don't have too much of a headache. Then understanding the internal protocol of that supplier. So the O is the organized. Of course, if the business isn't organized, it's going to cause more headaches for me then to start with. I might as well do it myself. Um, for those that are interested and haven't come across this analysis before, if you don't mind, when we send out the recording to your good selves, I've also written an article around this to give some further advice. So we will be sending that out to you as well. And in particular, when I talk about competitor benchmarking there, I think that's a really crucial stage as well. It's not just evaluating that one supplier in isolation. You need to do some benchmarking like we do in safety, looking at whether our competitors are doing a, a better health and safety record or not. We need to see if there's any SaaS competitors that are offering something better. And once again, if you're struggling to do any benchmarking, I do have a couple of temp templates that I'd be more than happy to share with you good selves. So please do get in touch offline after this webinar. And I, I guess focusing on that benchmarking, you know, Bob, if I may ask another question, I'm sort of really intrigued to understand how you go about competitor benchmarking in your operations at the moment and whether there's any challenges or tips and advice you can give the rest of the audience here. Yeah, yeah of course, uh, Rob. I mean, ADCOT work you know, on contracts, with government-based contracts, all the way down through to small domestic jobs, so, um, and everything in between, really. You, you know, so we have a, a fairly simple pro uh, process within the business where we sort of tend to measure any product um, we used to use against our current or uh, feedback and analysis data. So we have a very basic spreadsheet sort of setup where we do that. Uh, and we collate the data for successful and non-successful bids during our sort of um, benchmarking processes, which helps us then sort of almost celebrate the reds, if you like, the failures. We can celebrate them and grow positively in that area. Um, we tend to use um, or offer a high-end sort of product, really, that... Um, we, we sort of mirror our, our sort of business outlook, if you like, in terms of that we want any supporting products like the SaaS, for instance, to, to be a high end product as well. There's no point in having something that sits down, you know, at the bottom of the road when we're looking for something really that sits up at the top of the building. And, and this certainly fits that sort of that, that benchmark in that respect. Um, one, one thing that stood out with this is a bit of a tip, really, I suppose, uh, in regards to sort of aid with the benchmark in these particular products is I did a lot of research over a couple of years. In fact, it was two to three years of work to get to this stage where we're using this SaaS product. And um, from product to supplier to product supplier, there was a, a vast sort of difference. And, um, and without a shadow of doubt, companies performed um, differently. And what they did early on with their feedback and their support also played out then during later engagement. So if it was a poor service at the beginning, it tended to carry on through. Um, so it's something that we picked up on quite quickly. So first impressions really do matter, you know, in terms of when you're benchmarking and and you're looking for those products out there. So so the, the glossy advert is a good start, but it's actually when you start to get into the meat of the bones, how that actually performs when you need it to. Um, we, we use our current um, employee and customer feedback sort of system as well with regards to our, our approach and the implementation of any of the works I've discussed previously. And... Whilst we do that, we analyze our competitors' successes and failings as well as far as we can anyway, at least. And it just provides a good sound um, grounding of what our needs are and what our future is going to look like. And we do look to the future. We always 
are projecting five to 10 years ahead. So we need to look at products that are going to support that vision, if you like. Sure. Oh, th thank you for that, Bob. You know, certainly what I'm hearing is that feedback mechanisms are absolutely crucial to gain that further understanding looking forwards and, and still doing this robust due diligence. And I forgot to mention the reason I haven't just put a random photo on here. Um, this is you know, kind of giving an example that sometimes, you know, trying to choose a supplier can be like choosing a colour in your, in your living room. You know, there's so many shades on, that's on offer, but what's going to work for you? What do you like? What are your preferences? Is it going to work for your business? So it's always looking for that fit. And maybe as a final note, if I may, are just those four questions I presented there. If you're still struggling and you really want to start on a first baby step, OK, what questions do I need to think about that maybe other suppliers won't challenge you with or won't um, be very forward about is understanding after the sales process as well. And but when you're in that negotiation stage, I often found these four questions when I was implementing SAS products in my past experience, these were really valuable. Because if I bought a product off the shelf, I wanted to make sure that I was still going to get that support. So the first question I think you should always challenge suppliers with is if you do require training or your users will need that training, you know, is that part of the onboarding process? What do you actually do there to interact with the product and make sure that people can use it flawlessly? And if you are then using SaaS products, my second question there is how are updates handled? You know, is there any disruption or downtime that's going to affect my operations? or actually updates then flawlessly put in place without you even noticing until maybe you get an email or an in-app message to say, you're now using the latest version. I guess that goes back to Jamie's analogy about buying old bits of CDs to get the latest software parts. That SaaS experience is all about having the most recent version at all times. And it's then looking at the ongoing support. So it's all well and good, I bought a product 12 months ago, what other support am I going to get? Is there a key account manager, for example, that can support me? Is there like a, a Monday to Friday service where I can just phone up when I've got a particular issue? And sometimes people forget to ask about that sort of ongoing TLC that we're all expect that should expect. And then lastly, coming back to, I guess, our second slide of what truly are the benefits of using a SaaS system for our business? Are we using it just to stay ahead of the curve or is it offering all those other benefits that we've been discussing? And of course, that's not an exhaustive list that we've shared. There's loads of other benefits in terms of time, money and, and effort as well that we always talk about when we talk about the world of health and safety. So I hope that's a little bit of insight then, everyone, about where you should go if you want to then adapt SaaS products further. And, and by all means, I'm always happy to answer any questions offline if you think of anything. But Mason, probably if I hand back to your good self, then I think you said there were a couple more questions that you wanted to discuss be before introducing the final webinar at the end of the month. Yeah, of course, I think Jamie might have had a, um, a, a point to add. Was that on the previous slide, Jamie? Yes, exactly, yeah. If you can move back to the previous slide, maybe, Rob. And yeah, of course. Got... Yeah, apologies, Jamie. Yeah, um, yeah. it's just that I, I think Rob, um, Bob um, raised a, a really valid point about the you know the end-to-end -end experience of, of um, you know, engaging with a company because, well, a software provider, because it's not just the software that you're using, which is the, the product, it's the, you know, it's the customer support, it's the onboarding, it's all of that stuff. And when I talk about user experience, generally I am talking about, you know, the design of the, of the actual product, but above that, you've got the, the level, um, which we call customer experience. And, you know, we try and take that same approach um, and, um, you know, continue trying to improve the, the, the approach that we have of our product, we also apply to our sales process and to our customer service process. And it's important to, to make sure that um, it's not just a great product, but the whole experience is good because, you know, we've got customers that have been with us since the very beginning, you know, seven, eight years uh, that, that have been with us now. And those are, you know, really strong relationships. And that's because, um, you know, we're constantly um, looking at all, lots of different metrics, some, uh, you know, less tangible things, but just constantly trying to improve those relationships, the way we work with customers, the way we sell to customers. Um, and I think it's really important now that, um, you know, actually when it comes to selling, we, we sell in the way that customers want to buy. Yeah, such a valid point. It's that voice of the customer, isn't it, Jamie? We need to make sure, are we truly fitting what people are wanting? And, and that goes back to our original analogies about SaaS isn't just solving a problem, it's enhancing that whole experience for everyone. So no, thank you for that insight, I appreciate that. Mason, okay, thank you. Yeah. 
No, thanks very much. Um, any final questions, feel free to throw them in. We did have a couple of questions that came in. They're sort, sort of more, I guess, product related. Um, we will be running a, uh, a webinar in a few weeks, actually, um, which is around the product. So we can answer a few of those product related questions um, there. Um, I know we've had a couple of questions about um, internet connectivity, more product related, so we can answer those there at that point. But if anyone does have any questions about procurement processes or searching for the right software, feel free to throw them um, in now and, and we can take a couple of minutes out to answer those. Um, it is worthwhile, whilst I'm waiting for a few questions to come through, um, it's worthwhile mentioning that um, we are going to be having our, our sort of final webinar of the series in a couple of weeks. Uh, this is actually about implementing SaaS solutions, so implementing softwares and how do you get the best out of that process from customer success teams or onboarding teams, um, whoever that might be. So we'll be covering off, um, you know, as I said, how, how to get the most out of that process, um, what's expected from the onboarding process, potentially some red flags as well, which, which may occur. Um, and I think we'll be having some special guests as well to be able to, uh, from our team also, to be able to explain a little bit about how our process looks. Um, and as Bob's mentioned uh, and complimented our process of onboarding, how we manage to make sure that um, our customers get the most out of the onboarding process and really utilize the, the system um, as much as they possibly can. Um, so yeah, feel free to pop your questions in if you've got, uh, if you've got any, uh, if not, um, then, then you're free to go. <laughs> and uh, we look forward to having you on um, our next webinar uh, in a couple of weeks time. We look forward to seeing you there. We will be sending the recording out of this webinar as well. So feel free to share this around. Um, to, to any colleagues within your business or anyone else that you might feel uh, it's worthwhile um, looking um, over this webinar.